All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Jovita Woodridge, and I am the Volunteer Services Director for Volunteer Florida. And we are so excited to start our Volunteer Engagement Leadership Series today. Uh, harnessing volunteer value, driving organizational success. And we're thrilled to have Beth Steinhorn with us, my right, Beth, um, who's going to be speaking in a moment. Just very quickly uh, wanted to share a couple of things with you, um, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Make sure I figure out how to click that. <laughs> All right, so uh, I know many of you are familiar with us, but just very quickly, Volunteer Florida is the governor's lead agency for volunteerism and national service, and um, every state has a state service commission, and a lot of people don't realize that, and we are um, um, we were created in order to receive certain streams of federal dollars for AmeriCorps, which is national service. Um, and then we have built out over the years uh, to have additional components to our mission. Um, so we're the lead agency for volunteers and donations before, during, and after disasters. And we do focus again on national service, on fostering volunteerism, and then also on that emergency management component. And we really want to see Floridians who were engaged, communities that are transformed, and we want Florida to be a better place to live, to work, to play. And we know that that is what your organizations are also committed to. And so we're really thrilled that you're joining us this morning. Real quickly with the job that I have here, which I love, um, I am focused on training and resources, relationship building and volunteer connect, which I will share just a, a, a brief bit about. It's our volunteer opportunities platform. I hope you all register for this. It's an opportunity for you to post your volunteer opportunities. And then as Floridians are browsing and have an interest, they can register for those opportunities. There are a number of different management functions as well. And um, you can register on our website. I am happy to answer any questions that you might have about uh, the platform. I am volunteer at volunteerflorida.org. Pretty simple there. So again, volunteer at volunteerflorida.org. But we hope that you will uh, browse the site, find out a little bit more about Volunteer Connect and register for that opportunity. Uh, and we really, again, want to see those engaged Floridians. So that is um, my vision and my goal as, as well as the, uh, the goal of our organization. So this morning, we have shifting from program to strategy, embracing volunteer engagement to fulfill mission. As many of you uh, probably realize, we have three other sessions over the course of October, every Monday at 10.30 a.m. If you go to volunteerflorida.org, you'll see uh, those opportunities there and ways for you to register. So we hope you'll join us each Monday, but we're really excited for this particular program uh, that we have um, uh, shortly. So I want to introduce Beth to you all. Uh, she's the president of VQ Volunteer Strategies, which is a fantastic organization that focuses on volunteer engagement solutions. And she may share a little bit more about that uh, during her presentation, author of multiple books and articles. You go to points of light, number of different um, organizations, types of websites, you're gonna see information from her that is very timely and relevant to our field. She is an extremely popular and very frequent speaker and trainer across the country. And she is very much so a thought leader who participates in national dialogue about volunteerism and engagement. And you'll probably hear a bit more about service enterprise as she shares some examples um, of, of that moving from program to strategy. Um, and she is a service enterprise trainer. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, turn it over to Beth. If you have questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. Any other concerns you have, feel free to put in the chat. You can um, chat with me directly as Volunteer Florida, that's my name uh, for this particular webinar. Uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and let Beth take it away. Beth, so glad to have you. Thanks, Javita, and good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for this kickoff to the um, wonderful series that Javita described. Uh, I'm honored to be joining and, um, and diving in. Uh, you will be receiving a copy of 
uh, or you'll have access, I believe, to a PDF of our slides. So I include this piece simply so you have my contact information um, as well if you have any follow-up questions or want to link in to me, et cetera. Um, as, as Javita mentioned, I'm president of VQ Volunteer Strategies. We're a Colorado-based firm, but I work throughout the U.S. and Canada specifically on volunteer engagement strategy and love waking up every morning, getting to talk about um, how organizations can increase their impact, fulfill mission by tapping into volunteer talent. So thank you for, for joining. I use the term volunteer engagement a lot, um, and I'd love to get your voices in our virtual room here and invite you to use the chat function um, if you can. I think that'd be easier than Q&A for this. And share how you define volunteer engagement. I know you, we have quite a few people here, so um, we may not be able to get to all the answers, but how, you know, I'm going to be throwing around this term volunteer engagement quite a bit. And um, believe me, I've spent years coming up with a variety of very jargon filled, very haughty sounding definitions of volunteer engagement. But over the years, I've also tried to be a little more um, direct and uh, straightforward in what I think volunteer engagement really mean. So as some of you are hopefully weighing in using the Q&A or the chat function to share some of your ideas, um, I'll share one of my favorite. Oh, nice. Tommy weighed in. Now oh, I've, I've tap danced long enough to get a few answers in here. Um, volunteer that feels valued and welcome. That's a great indicator of effective volunteer engagement. Having volunteers feel immersed in their organization and their particular position. Um, when volunteers are fully on board with the mission for the organization they're serving and they're flexible, adaptable, and understand their worth. Oh, I love using the word worth. You'll hear that when my friend and colleague Sue Carter Kale speaks in the coming weeks about uh, volunteer, about uh, measuring uh, volunteer value and worth. I'm um, creating meaningful volunteer opportunities. I love it. So none of those are wrong, let me just say, but let me share my favorite definition of volunteer engagement. It's a simple math equation. Engagement equals relationship plus action. So what does that really mean? We all know of many instances, we can think of those times when we've heard uh, or ourselves have taken part in an opportunity to take action, right? We have volunteered. Maybe we show up and pack backpacks for school children, or perhaps we um, sort food in a food pantry, or we um, even maybe do some um, other differently skilled types of roles like design a newsletter for an organ our kids schools or something like that that's volunteering that's taking an action but unless we also have a relationship with the mission the people being served the other volunteers with whom we serve or the fellow the staff paid or unpaid um you know who are leading the organization we may not truly be engaged similarly we may have opportunities to to be connected to an organization where we have a relationship, maybe we have a connection to the cause, maybe we have a fiscal relationship, we pay membership dues, but unless we have meaningful opportunities to take action, we're not engaged. We simply have a fiscal relationship with that. So it's that combination of the two that really transforms mere volunteering into true engagement. And, and that's where we have the opportunity for the most strategic impact. That's why I tend to use the word volunteer engagement rather than simply volunteer management. When we do that, we really set our efforts apart and begin to shift from, as per the title of our session today, program to strategy. The difference between program and strategy is the difference between something that's nice to have and something that's vital to our organizational success. It's the difference between you or others in your organization serving as the volunteer engagement professional as a leader versus a coordinator who runs one program and might be dispensable if, say, a global pandemic hits and volunteer actions are, are curtailed due to safety concerns. 
it's the difference between volunteers being viewed as participants of a volunteer program, therefore pitting them in competition with clients and program participants for other parts of your organization, competition for resources, versus viewing them as partners in our work. So I want to say that one again, because I think that I've seen the most light bulbs go off in people's eyes when I say this. When we talk about volunteer engagement or volunteer management as a program, we pit volunteers in competition with clients for resources because they're viewed as the recipients of a program rather than as partners in our work. When organizations embrace volunteer engagement as a core strategy, we can see a tremendous number of benefits. The Service Enterprise Initiative is a national movement led nationally by points of light, but delivered individually by uh, locally by local hubs. And it's an opportunity to um, help organizations through a data-driven diagnostic training and ultimately certification receive a designation that indicates that they are in fact an organization that truly leverages volunteers and their talent for their social mission. And back in 2009, as this movement was developing, uh, there was some research that finally began to explore whether there is a difference between organizations that engage volunteer, that position volunteer engagement as a core strategy and those that don't. And is there a difference between those who position it and do it well and those who don't do it as well? And among the research findings that revealed the distinction or the, the um, differences between those that make volunteer engagement core to their operations were these five findings. That when organizations do volunteer engagement well and make it core to their mission, uh, all organizational capacities are significantly and markedly stronger. That means technical capacities, leadership capacities, financial capacities. When, they, when organizations engage and manage any number of volunteers well, they're better led and better managed across the organization. These organizations, which have been deemed service enterprises, are significantly more adaptable, sustainable, and capable of going to scale. That's the one I want to pause about and focus on now, because has there ever been a time in our history that has been more important than the events of the last 18 months that makes being adaptable, sustainable, and capable of going to scale more relevant? The events of the last 18 months have challenged our organizations to the core. They have caused us to rethink our service delivery, our service models, many organizations having to shut down while others having to scale to an unprecedented level to help people address increased food insecurity due to the economic fallout of the pandemic, to address increasing frightening social isolation among young adults and you know, teens and older adults as well, all adults, in fact. Um, so uh, if there's ever been a time when we should be thinking about what could equip our organizations to adapt, to sustain, and even go to scale, um, certainly now is the time to do that. There are other benefits as well, but we'll move on to some, to look at it through different lenses. Volunteering, also uh, can help, especially in these challenging economic times, um, help our community members find work. Volunteer engagement is a, or engaging as a volunteer is a proven pathway to employment. Due to the pandemic, we had been seeing very high unemployment and we've seen historically that Americans turn to volunteering when unemployed or underemployed. According to AmeriCorps at the time called Corporation for National and Community Service, a brief, a research brief in 2012. It revealed that unemployed people who volunteer are 26% more likely to find employment than those who don't volunteer. So we can certainly see this as an opportunity to engage volunteers to help keep their resumes fresh as they rethink their careers, to add new skills to their resumes as they make a pivot that so many people have been inspired to do amid the events of the last year and a half. 
Volunteers also extend or really expand our financial resources. Obviously, volunteers can be a great multiplier of resources in that they help fundraise on behalf of an organization, but they also are twice as likely to make financial donations as non-volunteers. Furthermore, among high net worth individuals, and this isn't just millionaires, um, this is households of approximately $200,000 in income, according to a US trust report in 2016 and reconfirmed by more recent reports by Fidelity and US trust, 84% of high net worth donors who volunteer give financially to all, most, or some of the organizations where they volunteer. Plus they give a third again as non-volunteers. Um, this was also confirmed by a recent study by Verified Volunteers and Volunteer Match, not just for high net worth donors, but for all volunteers. If you're seeking to make the case for greater engagement in your community, as Javita mentioned, the whole mission of Volunteer Florida is to equip you and your organizations to strengthen your communities and serve your communities throughout your state. Here are five research-based benefits of engaging community members. It builds resilience. Resilience is defined as the capacity within a city to survive, adapt, and grow, no matter what kinds of chronic stresses and acute shocks they experience. So that's the, the prolonged pr pandemic of the last year and a half. That's the unfortunate and tragic hurricanes your state has to face and, and any other type of um, unexpected uh, disaster or challenge. It also strengthens economic well-being related to that piece about workforce development. It leads to better health among volunteers and therefore your communities. It builds the capacity of city agencies and engaging volunteers can also help achieve diversity and inclusion objectives. Of course, uh, <coughs> excuse me, also events of the last uh, year and a half certainly have, have increased the spotlight uh, on issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, racial inequities, racial injustices, and um, has revealed cracks in our traditional volunteer engagement system that have been there for a long time. And we're now able to, um, in a more cohesive, intentional, and informed way, begin to, to heal and address. At the basic level, engaging volunteers can bring in diverse perspectives and skills. It provides a pathway for new community members to integrate into your, their new community. It makes for more meaningful connections with residents to better serve and better serve community members. And it also increases performance. Spurred in large part by the protests and, um, and again, uh, it, it, uh, increased spotlight of the last year and a half, uh, again, revealing things that have existed for far longer than the last 18 months, DEI has been thrust further into the forefront of individuals and organizations' focus. But it's not just the rise, <laughs> excuse me, not just the rise in public attention that underscores the importance of DEI work. Studies show that diverse and inclusive organizations outperform others. McKinsey has released numerous studies reaffirming the business case for both ethnic and cultural diversity and gender diversity in corporate leadership. And while research shows that the most diverse companies are now more likely than ever to outperform less diverse peers on profitability, we can extrapolate that mission-driven organizations would benefit comparatively in terms of impact as well. And of course, as all of us are involved with organizations designed to serve community, the more we can engage volunteers and paid staff members that reflect those communities whom we are serving through meaningful partnerships and strong relationships, the more effective and um, sustainable we can be as well. So those are, that's a sweeping quick look at some of the benefits of engaging volunteers not as a program that's nice to have, but as a strategy that's critical for mission fulfillment. Better adaptability, sustainability, and ability to scale. 
um, more resources in that volunteers are a multiplier effect. Um, greater opportunity to reflect and partner meaningfully with communities being served um, and, and greater impact and performance, greater capacity. Those are just, again, some of the benefits of engaging volunteers as part of your core mission. And here's the image I'd like you to have in your head, the one that drives a lot of my work. When I talk about program versus strategy, one of the pictures I have is of a traditional org chart for an organization. When volunteer management is a program, it's often at the bottom or side of some branch of that org chart, buried perhaps down here, right? But when, and, and so it's at the bottom for like some direct service and at the board level. But when volunteer engagement is truly a strategy, then picture your org chart with circles for your paid staff and triangles for your unpaid staff, your volunteers, there are volunteers sprinkled throughout every level horizontally and vertically on that org chart, helping not only with board governance and direct service, but also with operational and capacity work like marketing and fundraising and financial audits and assessments and um, uh, data records and IT, they're throughout the whole organization at middle management and C-suite level org, um, uh, org chart uh, as well. Because volunteers can build our capacity to achieve mission in all parts of our organization. But you can't get there by doing the same thing that you've always done. Ultimately, for many organizations, it's about change. If you're way over here on the spectrum from program to strategy, then it's about changing and moving into kind of the middle here. But if you're already partway there, it's, there's always opportunities to build capacity and move further along the spectrum towards strategic engagement. So there's going to be change involved. And when you're a leader of volunteers, a volunteer engagement professional, change is often a challenging thing to, to um, motivate, to, to mobilize people around. According to change leadership expert, John Cotter, management doesn't do the same as leadership when it comes to um, inspiring change. So let's look at what Cotter says about the difference between management and leadership. Management is a set of processes that can keep a complicated system of people and technology running smoothly. The most important aspects of management include planning, budgeting, organizing, staffing, controlling, and problem solving. When it comes to volunteers, that might look like planning how many volunteers would be needed to support an upcoming event, budgeting for volunteer software recognition efforts and training for staff or volunteers, organizing volunteer roles and shifts to support a program, controlling how volunteers are screened, placed into roles, and troubleshooting challenges, maybe with no-show volunteers or staff who are a little resistant to engaging volunteers or uncomfortable providing feedback. Any of that sound familiar to you? I guess as some of you spend a lot of time doing those things. Leadership, by contrast, is something different. Cotter writes, leadership is a set of processes that creates organizations in the first place or adapts them to significantly changing circumstances. Leadership defines what the future should look like, aligns people with that vision, and inspires them to make it happen despite obstacles. So what does that look like in volunteer engagement? It might look like engaging the whole organization to develop a vision statement for volunteer engagement that also articulates how it directly supports your mission. It's about building, might look like for building buy-in, might look like taking that vision and visiting different departments and building buy-in for that vision. It might look like inspiring staff in all departments to become part of that vision, assessing how they can engage volunteers in their work. It could look like equipping others to be successful in engagement or 
building accountability so that everybody plays their part in overcoming obstacles. That means ensuring that the strategy is well-resourced, that expectations are clear and shared across the organization, and that success is communicated and shared widely. So no matter where you are on the spectrum from management to leadership, the question for today is really how can we each move that needle and shift our roles from mostly managing our days to instead leading the way to strategic volunteer engagement. So as any good uh, uh, trainer will do, I've asked a question and I'm going to attempt to answer it with a few different options here. I'm gonna share three different paths to uh, achieving that shift from program to strategy. I'm gonna take us down these three paths. First, developing a strategic plan for volunteer engagement. I'm going to share the story of Kim and the San Diego Humane Society, and also a more recent story of Saeed from Islamic Relief USA on how they have leveraged the process of developing a strategic plan to move the needle towards more strategic engagement. I'll also share a little bit about becoming a certified service enterprise, and I'll share the advice and experiences of Amy of the city of Boulder, Colorado in their effort to do that. And finally, I'm going to talk about leading by example. I'll introduce you to Tanya from Home Health and Hospice Care in New Hampshire, who modeled strategic engagement first by piloting change herself, and others in New York City who did so through the vision of a partner with a funding, uh, with a funder from their funding community. So we'll take a deep breath. And um, before we, we do our whirlwind tour down these three paths, I once again would love to get your voices in the room here. And, um, and let's see, Javita, I'm, I can launch the poll. There we go. You should each see a poll popping up on your screen, asking you to weigh in. We're going to start with the path down volunteer engagement, um, excuse me, the path for strategic plans for volunteer engagement. So I see a few people weighing in. Thank you, early, early answerers. The question is, does your organization have an overall strategic plan that mentions volunteer engagement, a volunteer engagement plan, dedicated one, neither of the above, or let's be honest, you might not even really know. So, um, and that doesn't really leave room because we have limited number of question, um, answer possibilities. You might have a strategic plan overall for the organization, but it doesn't mention volunteer engagement. In that case, put neither of the above, though it's a good place to start to try and kind of map your actions. Okay. Wow, we're got we have great participation. Thank you all. I'm gonna just do one more little tap dance here um, so we can let a few, any few stragglers join in. And I'm going to close the poll in three, two, last few people come on in, get us over 80%. One, okay, I'm gonna end the poll and I'll share the results. You should see it popping up on your screen there. I love seeing that 38% of you have a strategic plan for your organization and it mentions volunteer engagement. Great place to start. Most often those help make the case for your efforts, but they don't go into enough detail necessarily to guide your work. So it might be helpful to have a complimentary plan to accompany that um, specific to volunteer engagement. But I love seeing that in almost 40% of your organizations represented, there's a strat plan that mentions volunteers. One in five of you, 20, uh, no, one in four of you, 25% have a volunteer engagement strategic plan. So I invite those of you, there's um, quite a few of you here, to weigh in with comments or any advice once I go through our, um, my example here from San Diego, because we, we certainly want to promote your networking and connections with your um, fellow um, practitioners across Florida um, to share your experiences as well. Um, no surprise, almost one in five of you have neither of the, neither of the above, and um, also almost one in five of you don't know, and that's not unusual. I encounter that quite a bit. So um, 
So uh, now that we know a little bit about kind of who's in the room and your experience, let me share the story for San Diego Humane. This is a story about, and it's a real story, <laughs> about um, an organization that shifted from program to strategy over the course of a couple years, and the results have been tangible and really far-reaching. What led San Diego Humane Society to invest in shifting from program to engagement as a strategy, especially since they already had a very robust program. They had more than a thousand volunteers when they embarked on this journey back in 2014. Uh, but they still recognized that they needed to move the needle. One of the first triggers for this was that they had an organization-wide strategic plan and knew that there were really lofty goals that would require volunteers to be successful, but they had no map really to guide their that journey. It wasn't really clear, and I'd ask the same questions of that 38% of you who have an organization-wide strategic plan that mentions volunteers. The question is, is there enough information and guidance in there to actually inspire collective action across the organization to engage volunteers towards all those strategic priorities in the strategic plan. San Diego didn't have that. They just knew they couldn't do that work without engaging volunteers. They also had gone through a number of mergers and expansions in recent years. They had um, merged with a couple other previously independent shelters, animal shelters, plus they had, um, which meant they had multiple campuses, and they also needed more consistent practices across those campuses. They also recognized that there was research out there showing that the landscape of volunteering was changing and that they hadn't really assessed and adapted their practices to make the most of those trends. They were, as I like to say, working despite the trends instead of working to leverage the trends. And finally, they knew that there was more they could be doing. Um, they could steward this resource of volunteer talent, human capital, as well as they were stewarding their financial capital and just didn't quite know exactly how to do that. So their journey first focused on creating a strategic plan for volunteer engagement. That was kind of their main event, so to speak, but their work involved many other elements as the years have gone by as well. And I'll just share, just to give you a sense of those mergers, um, their, they had, um, uh, recently, meaning like in the last two years prior to our, our working with them, they had um, uh, merged with another program in San Diego. They had um, merged with a campus up in Escondido, about 40, 50 miles northeast, and another one Oceanside. So they were spread across um, miles throughout the county uh, and, um, and were in those mergers kind of in inheriting or adopting or welcoming in cores of volunteers that were already committed to those organizations where they'd been serving. And between the mileage and the, um, and the new groups of volunteers, the different identities, the different loyalties, um, this is how their staff described the way that they were feeling when we first started working with them. They were a little um, overwhelmed and, um, and, and, um, uh, kind of at, at wit's end, um, as only uh, animal welfare uh, professionals can, can describe. So how did we get them off that ledge? How did we get them to sort of take a breath? Well, they went through a strategic plan development process. It began with an assessment. We, we were able to work with them on a site visit um, and visit all their different locations, interview a lot of staff. We did a, um, a, um, a comprehensive customized survey for volunteers and staff. These are all things that organizations can do on their own. They don't have to work with a consultant to do this. Um, and then, um, but however you do it with an outside consultant or internally, it's important to get a sense of the state of the state. A strategic planning process is about identifying a vision, your destination, and mapping out how you're gonna get there while identifying kind of what are the signposts posts we wanna pass along the way to make sure we know we're on track. And, um, and so when you're, when you're creating your own sort of GPS to success, you have to know where your destination is first, but in order to map it out, you also need to know where you are, right? You have to know where you're coming from. So that whole assessment piece was identifying their current location. Where were they in their engagement efforts? 
Then we convened a cross-divisional retreat where leaders were invited, the CEO, board members, volunteers who led cohorts of vol other volunteers like their Animal Rescue Reserve, which is a self-led affiliated organization, plus senior leadership from all across the organization, veterinary care, shelter operations, um, marketing, development. Interestingly, at first, Kim Soto, who's their director of volunteer engagement, was concerned that people might not show up. But as soon as word got out, they started approaching her and asking if they could come. No one had ever asked for input on volunteer engagement before, but they actually wanted their voices heard. So it was the start of a major paradigm shift. And together through this retreat, they developed a plan with a vision, four key pillars, which I'll share, and, and the actions that were gonna take them there. They implemented that plan over the next three years and revised it in their fourth year and are still implementing that. So I'd like to share some of the elements of their plan just to give you a sense of what a strategic plan for volunteer engagement looks like or can look like, and then share how it's played out in subsequent years in really what's the word, solidifying that shift from program to strategy. So here's their vision for volunteer engagement. How can I ever do a presentation that talks about an animal welfare organization without having an obligatory cute dog picture? Um, so here's their vision for volunteer engagement success. One of the most concise and I think powerful visions in all the organizations I've worked with on plans. It's simply impactful service for compassionate hearts. That's their vision, impactful service for compassionate hearts. It complements their overall vision, but focuses on how engagement fits into and supports the Humane Society's mission. Every effort is designed and evaluated against this vision. Their four strategic priorities became develop the right volunteer opportunities that are mission and vision aligned. That meant letting go of roles that were no longer strategic, among other things. It also meant creating new roles that were strategic. Estab Here's their second pillar. Establish practices that are pillars of our desired culture. They recognize how important culture is. That meant creating best practices and ensuring that they're consistent across the whole organization, across their multiple campuses. That meant having a vision of the culture they want and being ready to do the hard work of maintaining that culture. That fed into the hiring of staff as well as the engagement of volunteers. It meant getting everyone on board and modeling it. And frankly, whenever we're talking about culture, it also means being patient. A third priority of theirs was to provide the tools, resources, and strategies for success. This meant a volunteer handbook, or excuse me, a volunteer engagement guide with tools and resources that were accessible. This wasn't just their volunteer handbook, which they already had. This was about a guide for staff to equip them to successfully engage volunteers. They also reorganized their volunteer engagement department, aligning skills and tasks to actual needs. Kim exercised her leadership by not being beholden to that dreaded the way things have always been done. When you've had a department that successfully serves one shelter, but you had three new campuses over the course of 18 months, you have to rethink your HR model to be efficient and effective across all campuses. And this was a big one. They shifted the view of volunteer engagement department staff from managers to instead positioning them as internal consultants. As internal consultants, her staff attend department meetings at their campuses, they're welcomed as coaches to other staff to help them be successful. And their fourth and final strategic priority was to nurture connectivity and consistency across campuses and programs. Consistency was really key with multiple campuses. We heard from a lot of volunteers saying, I, I wanna show up at Escondido and do a good job. And then if I can volunteer at Oceanside, I wanna know that it's the same protocols, that I have the same rules to follow, the same expectations, right? It also has to do with logos and brands and protocols, but with explicit, and additionally, it has to do with explicitly sharing how the work of volunteers, no matter where they engage, contributes directly to the mission of the Humane Society. 
And that's about positioning everyone as part of one community. As a result of this work and Kim's demonstration of leadership throughout this planning process from 2015 to 2017, as the Humane Society was approached to take over the city and county contracts for all animal control, a potential expansion that would increase staff by more than 100 and get this, triple the number of volunteers. Um, yeah, triple the number of volunteers, yes. Um, she was in a position to not only have significant representation on senior leadership, but also to be invited to sit on the transition team, which spent a year planning for this potential transition, a transition which um, did in fact happen. So by elevating volunteer engagement table, so to speak, she first got significant advocacy at the senior leadership team in her director who supported and represented volunteer engagement at every senior leadership team meeting. But when the time came for a major shift in the organization, exponential growth through these city and county contracts, Kim was invited to sit on that transition team. Senior leadership recognized that volunteer engagement wasn't an afterthought. They needed her at the table to ensure a smooth transition and, and to help manage that merged workforce with hundreds of volunteers who already worked at county shelters. So she demonstrated the power of inviting others to her table and then in turn was invited to leadership table as well. I'll share another example of a strategic plan that's underway at the moment. In 2020, leaders of Islamic Relief USA were seeking a way to expand their engagement efforts. Like so many organizations, Islamic Relief was founded by volunteers. And while they've grown significantly to a large staff and a core of 17,000 volunteers in their records, certainly volunteers remain central to their work, but there was no overarching strategy. Volunteers supported events, but were limited in capacity building roles. The Volunteer Management Office was focused predominantly on supporting programs, not on building capacity. I don't think anyone from Islamic Relief would be surprised to hear me say they were kind of functioning as a fulfillment center, right? A department or a field office would call and say, we have an event. Can you get us, you know, 20 t-shirt clad volunteers to show up and help at this food pack um, event? Um, but you know, there was so much more potential than simply being a fulfillment center for volunteers. So over the last year plus, even amid restrictions and limitations on volunteering due to the pandemic, IRUSA focused on planning, following a similar process to San Diego Humane Society. They completed an assessment, they had interviews and um, surveys, uh, with, as well as connecting with peer organizations to identify replicable best practices, and they're in the process right now of completing the writing of their volunteer engagement strategic plan. And like San Diego, the plan is important, but the process has been just as important to this transformation. Throughout the year, that assessment process invited and reinforced that engagement could be everyone's responsibility and everyone could benefit. They've also shifted their language from talking about volunteers as a program to instead as a strategy. They've increased their tracking and communications about volunteer impacts. And even before the strategic plan has been finalized, which is gonna happen um, next week, uh, the mindset shift is evident in title changes of their key leadership for volunteer management. The volunteer management office has been elevated and the national manager switched titles even before the plan was finished. Saeed Dura is now um, assistant Director of Volunteer Engagement instead of National Volunteer Manager. The woman, Masuna Kojashi, who had been the Volunteer Administrator, is now National Volunteer Resources Coordinator. And the team out in the regions shift from Regional Volunteer Coordinators to Regional Volunteer Engagement Specialists. When you step up to be a strategic leader, your organization recognizes and respects that leadership. So let's, uh, let's take a pause and a little shift of gears from path one, which was in developing a strategic plan for volunteer engagement, and instead look at a different path 
which is the path that a city near and dear to me um, uh, took uh, a couple years ago as well. And before we we, we start walking down that beautiful trail, um, I will just encourage you, let you know that the Q&A box is open. You're welcome to put questions in. We'll have plenty of time at the end, but if I see something relevant to what I'm talking about, I'm happy to field those in the chat or in the Q&A as we go along. So one of the common themes of the previous two stories was that leadership recognized that volunteer engagement could be key to helping achieve new strategic priorities. A different path towards embracing volunteer engagement as a strategy rather than a program that's nice to have is um, the one that took place in this lovely image of beautiful Boulder, Colorado, a city that's nestled in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains and about 30 miles outside my office window. I can see those hills out my window right now. Lucky me. I don't have the beach here, but I have some beautiful mountains, so I'll take it. Like many cities, Boulder had volunteer programs throughout many of the city agencies, from libraries to parks and rec. Uh, they worked well for the city, or so they thought, until everything changed over the course of one week in September of 2013. In 2013, Boulder experienced unprecedented rain, um, which for you all in Florida is not going to sound like that much, but for Boulder, uh, it was devastating. Over the course of the week, between 18 and 20 inches of rain fell, which is just half an inch shy of what Boulder receives over the course of an entire year normally. The flooding was catastrophic, damaging 19,000 homes, destroying 1,500 of them, rendering miles of roads impassable, stranding thousands of people and tragically killing eight. While the rains were still falling and before the full devastation was apparent, Boulder residents stepped up to volunteer, as did thousands arriving from far off states to offer shelter, evacuees, um, <clears throat> to help evacuees, to clean out flooded homes, stores, churches, synagogues, schools, and more. But the city, while it was a model of excellence in emergency management coordination with first responders, had no system to coordinate the armies of well-intentioned volunteers. I'm sure you have experienced these, these spontaneous volunteers who show up um, to help when, uh, you know, good-heartedly when Florida has experienced its various um, disasters uh, in terms of hurricanes and tornadoes over the years. So while the floodwaters were receding, the city quickly identified a volunteer engagement strategy as a priority in their resiliency plan and for the city overall. They also recognized that having a strategy could only go so far. Truly implementing the strategy would require a culture shift. All agencies, not just libraries and parks, would need to be on board. And so they needed the right person. They needed a leader, not just a manager. And fortunately, the city's HR department already employed a woman, Amy Kane, who was absolutely the right person to do it. When Amy reflects on what helped the city shift from volunteers being something that's nice to have as part of Mountain Parks and Open Space Department, for example, to instead engaging volunteers as vital to their resiliency plan, as pro bono consultants on strategic planning, in recognizing that advisory boards are actually comprised of, oh, volunteers, what a surprise. And more, she identified four steps or set of activities that have been vital. One is getting the right people on board, organizing and prioritizing the work, embracing a learning culture, and sustaining the momentum. So let's unpack these a bit. What does it mean to get the right people on board? Well, she was a dedicated leader, but they also created something called the Volunteer Cooperative, which was all the different coordinators who were already, at least as a full-time job or as part of their job, explicitly responsible for engaging volunteers. So she brought together for the first time ever, all the people whose job included uh, engaging volunteers or coordinating that effort from across the city. But they didn't stop there and they met regularly. This volunteer cooperative continues to meet. In addition though, they created what was called the guiding coalition. They had a larger group of people who weren't solely responsible for volunteer engagement or even 
dedicated ongoingly to it, but whose teams were. So the chief of police, police and the um, head of fire, uh, uh, the fire department were not um, on their volunteer cooperative, but they showed up for their quarterly guiding coalition meetings to talk about how volunteers serve in those arenas as well. So they got the right people on board. They also organized and prioritized their work. They developed a strategic plan for volunteer engagement. They sought ser service enterprise certification, which meant that they engaged a large cross-divisional team in training and ultimate, ultimately certification. But all of that was about getting an action plan together that would help them really leverage volunteers strategically. And they invested in infrastructure improvements like volunteer management software, um, space for volunteers to work, et cetera. Third, they embraced a learning culture. They didn't just think about training volunteers, they trained staff. And Amy had a budget to support staff training in volunteer engagement. And they embraced the spirit of innovation. They recognized that experimenting and piloting is a way to learn and that it was even failing was a way to learn and would by piloting with small discrete efforts, they could build from there and, um, and roll out proven practices across the city. Finally, they really looked at sustaining the momentum. They put volunteer engagement in almost all staff members position, well, maybe not all city staff, but hundreds of city staff members position descriptions. They developed work plans, they shared successes that keeps people motivated and inspired. Today, the city manager's office is well aware of the importance of volunteer engagement. They continue to invest in volunteer engagement in many ways, a new state-of-the-art customized CRM system, the police chief and others continue to sit in on these meetings and think about how to engage volunteers in their work. And the city is more prepared than ever to face whatever changing conditions come along, whether more rain, economic challenges, or of course, COVID-19. The amazing new chapter uh, is that Boulder developed its plan to ensure it was more resilient. The strategy was born out of disaster, but it was of course tested over the last 18 months with the pandemic. And the strategy has passed that test. The results show that it is indeed positioned well to leverage volunteers in times of crisis. Immediately after the outbreak of the pandemic, Boulder updated its webpage in the language um, and the language on their Count Me In Boulder site to make it easier for the public to connect with volunteer opportunities. They also started publicizing their Get Involved page across um, uh, a cross-department page so that community members have a one-stop shop for all roles throughout the city of Boulder and um, where they're accepting applications. And we know people have wanted to step up and help in the last year and a half, but there have been limited opportunities. So it's been really helpful for them to be able to offer one place for the volunteers uh, in the, res the residents of Boulder to be able to step up. They also created a number of new volunteer roles like um, shelter volunteers who assist with um, at the shelters for screening for COVID symptoms and the COVID recovery center, the CRC with various tasks like providing food, laundry, direction, and even ambassador roles, outdoor roles. They've created roles with their open space in Martin, mountain parks and parks and rec um, to pr for volunteers to provide information outside to volunteer visitors at trailheads um, and parks about good trails to hike, trail etiquette, aquatic nuisance species. I'm guessing that even though Florida and Colorado are pretty different, one thing we may have in common is that people really enjoy being outside and have really taken advantage of that and the safety of that amid the COVID restrictions. This was all wrapped up in a plan called volunteerism during recovery. One of the other engagement leaders, Kate, explains that this was possible because they had an infrastructure of support and communications in place that was in many ways due to service enterprise and their strategic plan. And she added, and I'm gonna read, if you'll indulge me, read her quote. Uh, on a personal note, I want to share that my role as volunteer services coordinator has now been included in the Boulder Library leadership team. She was their library coordinator. 
As far as I know, this is the first time that a volunteer coordinator at the library has been involved at this strategic level, which is exciting and an important step for the library and for volunteerism. So once again, she led by example, leading the effort to put together that recovery, that volunteerism for recovery plan. And as a result was recognized the strategic contribution she could be making and her role was elevated because volunteerism was viewed not just as a program to be coordinated, but a strategy to be advocated for at the highest level. Okay, hopefully you're, you're still with me on this journey here. And we're gonna go down our final two paths or a final path with two examples of, um, of another way to really um, move towards strategic volunteer engagement. Both of the examples I gave really started with kind of a top-down approach, developing a strategic plan through a cross-divisional retreat, getting certified as a service enterprise and, um, and incorporating volunteer engagement into your citywide resiliency plan. That's all kind of really top down, but not everyone has that support or capacity um, or, or the right timing. So there are also tremendously successful examples of organizations that have shifted the culture by starting small, going for that sort of bottom up approach. That's what we're gonna talk about today. Leading by example, by starting in one discrete area of an organization where there are unmet needs, and engaging volunteers to address those needs. Then using what actually uh, one of these pilot groups referred to as proof of concept to inspire others. I love that. It was one of the volunteers on the team we worked with. So when I think of this proof of concept, this pilot piloting change approach, I often think of Tanya Prather, Prather at Home Health and Hospice Care in New Hampshire. With more than 400 dedicated volunteers, volunteers are of course, essential partners in providing care and patients to, um, to home health and hospice care, which uh, to the patients and families whom home health and hospice care serves throughout the greater Nashua and Manchester areas of New Hampshire. Prior to the COVID pandemic, volunteers supported patients in every environment, in their home, in the nursing home, and assisted living facilities, the community hospice house, and even behind the scenes. So safety concerns forced adaptations to service delivery, Volunteers continued to provide vital support to patients and families throughout the pandemic. And among those volunteer roles are vigil volunteers. Specially trained vigil volunteers provide company and comfort to patients who are actively dying. While Home Health and Hospice Care's volunteer coordinator had capacity to manage and schedule volunteers across the whole organization, scheduling vigil volunteers poses a unique and let's face it, time consuming challenge because it's difficult to determine when a patient might be ready for vigil presence and it's somewhat unpredictable. But also the length of time that each patient will need vigil volunteers varies patient by patient. Consequently, a few years ago, Home Health and Hospice Care set out to engage volunteer leaders to build the capacity of the program beyond what Tanya alone could achieve. So vigil volunteers have two primary responsibilities, scheduling and supporting vigil volunteers in the field, thereby relieving Tanya, the volunteer coordinator of needing to be available all day, seven days a week to respond to vigil requests and to schedule accordingly. Vigil team leaders also help coordinate and build capacity to check in with volunteers, with the vigil volunteers. Even now, years later, a few years after this role was first developed, home health and hospice care continues to reap the benefits from this leadership position. Home health and hospice care was able to grow the vigil program without hiring additional staff. They had a meaningful way to engage volunteers. Someone, one of you mentioned meaningful opportunities, Lori, at the beginning when I asked, how do you define volunteer engagement? Strategic volunteer engagement, creating meaningful opportunities. HHHC, Home Health and Hospital Care, was able to engage skilled volunteers in this program, including a recently retired hospice nurse who said, I don't want to do direct patient care, but I'd love to use my skills. And Tanya said, oh, you know, two years ago, I wouldn't have a role for you, but now I'd love for you to be a vigil team leader because you can mentor the volunteers who are out in the field. And that was a perfect match. Plus, 
This is about building momentum for success. Other staff members noticed the impact that the vigil leaders were having and began to request leadership volunteers for their department programs. They were literally like looking over the walls of the cubby saying, Tanya, how can I get some of these team leaders? I've got a team of pet therapy volunteers or I have a team of event volunteers. I'd love to have some leadership level volunteers. So she really led by example. She says, even as vigil work was greatly restricted during the pandemic, the vigil team leader reached out and maintained relationships. She also has become a trusted partner, providing emotional support to the volunteers, not to mention adding depth to our management team, unquote. When I see a question from Eva, I will, um, uh, is there a good app, get access to these? Uh, let's, I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. So um, I wanna share one other example before we open it up for some of these great questions and a little bit of discussion. When thinking about these different paths, um, uh, I also need to think about a, a recent example that really had to pivot amid this whole COVID crisis. And that's a project we have um, launched and been implementing uh, with our partners, UJ Federation of New York, in, that serves, uh, among other places, New York City. In 2019, we partnered with them to launch what we called the Volunteer Accelerator. This is a cohort-based training and coaching initiative that convened three organizations, Storefront Jewish Community Council, JCC of Rockaway Peninsula, and UJC of the Lower East Side, and provided them with their first dedicated training and support for strategic volunteer engagement. Like the example from Tanya in New Hampshire, this is about starting with one discrete issue, one discrete program area that could benefit from skilled volunteers and using that as a proof of concept um, to help launch that shift from program to strategy across an organization. Each of these three organizations ran a food pantry, but didn't have a systematic volunteer engagement infrastructure. They also each had recently received funding from UJA for what's known as a digital pantry, technology designed to allow clients to place customized orders based on inventory and client preferences, dietary restrictions, and need for food packages. The concept is, of course, wonderful. It's a more client-centric approach, a more dignified approach for um, those in need of food to, to get the food that um, matches their, their, their own preferences and needs. But the practice actually requires more volunteer time. And the organizations needed support to develop and implement that, as well as training and coaching on the philosophy and approach of engaging volunteers strategically. And in case you're wondering why should something that's, you know, leverages technology so well take more volunteers, well, it's because clients need training on how to use the technology to access the digital pantry and use it. Plus, food packages are now customized, so it takes more time to package customized food requests um, rather than just blanket everyone gets this much rice and this much tuna and, and whatever fresh produce is available. So in order to provide all of this, this is where UJA came in. As a funding, they sought to support their grantees in increasing their impact, and they knew that volunteer engagement could help them do that. So they developed uh, this accelerator, which we partnered with them to develop and, and deliver. After some initial assessments and training, um, we found ourselves uh, beginning to develop work plans and um, volunteer position descriptions for each of these uh, three organizations to really begin implementing a volunteer engagement strategy. And let's see, when was that? Oh, that was, we got to that point by mid-March of 2020, when of course COVID-19 hit and everything changed. Fortunately for these organizations, we had already introduced the concepts of strategic volunteer engagement. We'd begun the fundamentals of needs assessments and position design. And of course, as food pantries, these organizations were not among the dozens or hundreds or thousands who shut down their volunteer engagement efforts. Instead, they found themselves facing dramatic increases in demand for services, including food assistance. And while the digital pantry rollouts were delayed because they couldn't be meeting with clients and looking over devices close up to um, 
you know, teach them how to use technology, um, they, the engagement volunteers, the engagement of volunteers to handle this exponential increase in food requests began in earnest. Fortunately, leadership was already bought into the idea of engaging volunteers as a way to address critical needs, and each pantry pivoted really quickly, as did we all, and engaged volunteers in response to the pandemic to a degree they would not have been able to imagine just a year prior. Because they'd already begun building, bringing, um, being bought into engaging volunteers to help in one discrete way, they could imagine a bigger future where volunteers were partnering with them to address other needs. For example, JCCRP had a couple volunteers approach them and say, we think we could partner with a local supermarket to create not only a drop, you know, like a, a, a food drop for your food packages in the parking lot, but a, a, a low contact or no contact drop, but also we'd like to partner with the you, JCCRP, and the food store to develop a savings program where community members could actually make donations financially for 50% of a family in need for their grocery run or 100% covering free staples so that community members in need could go to the grocery store, um, um, sign up through this website, get reduced or free groceries while also receiving the pickup um, from JCCRP's food pantry in the parking lot. It was uh, a great success during the most critical parts of the of the pandemic. Follow-up evaluations have shown that all three digital food pantries in the accelerator measurably improved their use of engagement practices, recruiting, screening, training, tracking volunteers, and most importantly, they increased the number of food pantry volunteers and clients being served. Um, as we had hypothesized, buy-in for strategic engagement of volunteers within the organizations expanded well beyond just the food pantry into other service areas. Uh, JCCRP engaged more than 75 virtual volunteers in the 2020 census project and 100 volunteers in the Get Out the Vote campaign. And all of these organizations have been mobilizing volunteers to support the needs of older adults and Holocaust survivors in getting vaccinations. So that idea of let's start with one discrete need and let's use this as a demonstration of the power and potential of strategic engagement, it gets other people, including those who may have been resistant, excited about the process. So let me share a couple tips for uh, success, and then I want to open it up for discussion and um, take some of these questions that are um, popping up in the chat and in the Q&A. First, as you plan ahead, consider um, you know, all these different paths. What did all of these, so that you can figure out which is the right path forward for you. What did all of these paths have in common? Well, nothing was handed to them. Some started top down like IRUSA, some moved more bottom up like home health and hospice care, and still others due to an external catalyst like Boulder and the flood. And um, the pantries, frankly, they were catalyzed by funder support. But today, all have leaders of volunteer engagement who are seen as strategically vital to the organization's success. And it's on them, it's on their shoulders to keep it going. So here's how they recommend, and talking with Kim and Tanya and um, folks at JCCRP, you know, this is how they recommend you keep this, this going. First, articulate the value and potential of volunteer engagement. That means knowing the research, being able to articulate it. If you create a volunteer engagement plan, Kim from San Diego always says, make it look as professional as it is. Get your graphics department to, to make you a nice cover. It's, it's not just something for the circular file. It really is, um, it really is uh, uh, worthy of professional treatment um, and it needs to be kind of on your desk, on your website um, and referenced equally. And connect the dots for fiscal, for leadership to understand the fiscal impact. Make it a priority, put it on senior staff and board agendas, write volunteer engagement into staff position descriptions. So it's not just the volunteer department's responsibility, but it's everyone's responsibility and their managers must hold them accountable because it's in their job descriptions. 
position volunteer engagement staff as leaders. Have the director of volunteer engagement or volunteer services come to senior staff meetings occasionally. Get training as a coach. Have the organization chart show your dotted line relationship as a resource to others in the organization. And place volunteers in the departments on the chart where they serve, not under your department. I'm going to say that again because I think visuals are so important. Don't, if, if, first of all, volunteers should be on your org chart. Let's start with that. And if they are um, on your org chart, don't just put them underneath the volunteer services department. They report and should be supported by whatever department they serve in. So they should be spread throughout your org chart, just like not all paid staff members are under the HR department. HR may serve as a support training and sort of functional consultant to all managers, but the person in HR is not directly supervising all of these paid staff. Same thing with volunteers. And finally, measure, gather, and share results. Track project, um, track your progress, excuse me, share your successes, and be, it, once you have, I encourage you to take Sue, all the other sessions, but I'm thinking of um, Sue Carter-Kale, who's doing one, I imagine, on volunteer impacts. Um, she has some great advice about talking about not just the value of volunteers, but their worth, not just um, measuring impacts, but revealing impacts. So um, that is really going to help tell your story, or more importantly, the story of strategic volunteer engagement. Ultimately, it's about carving your own path. It may not look exactly like Amy's or Kim's or IRUSA's, but these tips will hopefully help you map your journey from management to leadership and from program to strategy, whatever that path may be. So I'm gonna pause. I have some questions for you, but let me take um, one of the questions. Uh, there's kind of a theme of some of the questions I'm seeing. People are interested in samples of strategic plans for volunteer engagement and also the assessment. So um, I'm happy to share with Javita an article or a link. I can't multitask and do it at the moment, but there's a link I can share to a page on our website where we have an article that's free and downloadable um, from uh, eVolunteerism, now it's Engage Magazine, um, about the San Diego Humane Society process. And there are excerpts from that, their plan. I'm not at liberty to share a full plan that belongs to the organizations. Um, but I can share that because it really explicitly talks about the process and also the, um, it goes over a lot of the things that I talked about, but in more detail. So I'll share that link with Javita and Javita, I trust you'll be able to get that out to everyone. Um, uh, additionally, there's a question about the assessment. Do I have an example of one, of what one would look like? Um, so Samantha, yes, the assessments look different for every organization, because of course it depends on how they're structured. Do they have field staff? You know, the parts that look most different are the part of the assessment that has to do with the staff side. The volunteer side is customized, but but um, not always, there's not as much variation. So um, again, I'm not at liberty to share specific uh, assessments, but we do have some general assessments on our website that I'm happy to share. Oh, good. Uh, Javita just shared our, the link to our tools and templates page. Um, and on our tools and templates page, there is an assessment, kind of a short version of an assessment, which you can use to get started. And Javita, if you're Googling around on that, if you, there's an articles and e-newsletters page, I think under resources, if you want to find that page, that's where the San Diego Humane Society article is. And there's also an article on there about Boulder. Um, right. So, um, perfect. Thank you. Um, so those are, she's putting it in the chat. You can access those there. There's an article on Boulder. There's, our assessment is on the tools and templates page. Um, okay. So I don't know that I missed any other question other than um, some things about recordings, which Javita has, has um, replied to. So um, let me pose a couple questions. Let me, let, me, let me pull a few things together and pose some questions to you all to hopefully use the chat and weigh in so you can learn from each other and, um, and also perhaps ask some questions. If you're looking to shift your culture from program to strategy, 
then um, three things, three of the things that I, were sort of embedded in the stories that I told today were, of course, building support. You can build support by um, having leadership with you doing these top-down approaches. Um, or you can build support by frankly leading by example, right? You can just say, I'm gonna go in this kind of the guerrilla warfare way and I'm just gonna go ahead and engage volunteers in my work or partner with one program or department that um, kind of sees the light and gets excited about this. So um, we're going to uh, uh, pilot something and build support because we're gonna demonstrate results. Um, it is all about influencing peers, right? It's all about finding those people even if their titles aren't volunteer director, who are interested and open to engaging volunteers and then engaging them as champions for the effort, either because you're supporting them with new ways of engaging volunteers or getting them to systematize what they're already doing um, or getting them to be advocates on your behalf. Um, and ultimately lead by example. I hate, I know this is being recorded, I hate to say this, but I'm always surprised, even though I've been doing this for more years than I wanna count, at how reluctant some volunteer engagement professionals are to engage volunteers in their own work. Lead by example, what are the pieces you could use help with? Just like Tanya from Home Health and Hospice Care. She wanted to, um, she engaged vigil team leaders because she was strapped for time to be able to schedule and support all the, the needs of the vigil volunteers. So start by looking at your own needs and lead by example by engaging volunteers in ways that help build your capacity beyond what you alone can achieve. Um, I see a question coming in. Linda says, as a volunteer director who's inherited many other responsibilities as a result of losing 30% of our staff since COVID downsizing, I hear you and you're not alone and I, I'm, I, it's a real challenge. Do I have any suggestions on getting the job back and eliminate some of the things that have nothing to do with my position? Mm. Well, um, I certainly open it up to others who have additional advice. And while maybe some are um, thinking of that, let me share again first my, you know, my, my empathy for you that you, like so many other people, have, have had your job descriptions completely reworked. I have a friend who's a volunteer coordinator who, you know, ends up spending um, three out of five days a week screening people for temperatures and, and other things as people are coming in the, the senior residence facility where she works. Um, and it's hard to engage volunteers and do that sort of work when you're spending three out of five days, you know, checking people's temperatures at the front desk. So I get it. Um, and I would say that first and foremost, you need to kind of do your own assessment. How You need to be able to make the case for how volunteers are going to continue to be or can be engaged as vital to your organization's recovery and reopening, whatever the mission is, right? How can you, um, how can you uh, uh, demonstrate and track what volunteers are doing or what's possible? Start small and talk about the additional growth um, that would be possible if you had more time to source and manage that resource. Um, Javita, did you want to answer that as well? I'm not sure if that message meant you wanted to come on and talk about that too. Oh, um, no, I think that that's really okay. great. Those are those are such tricky uh, realities. And again, just that uh, ability to um, showcase the return on investment of those volunteers and the time that yeah. is required because it is a strategic component of the organization, sharing that in a very proactive, offensive way <laughs> versus yeah. kind of in a, in a defensive way, um, I think can be, um, can go a long way. And doing that kind of at intervals as you are, um, as your experiences are, are, are kind of shifting uh, and as you have opportunity with the appropriate, men, uh, you know, um, individuals in senior management. Yeah. So very similar to, to what you shared. Thanks. And I'll share one other piece that um, uh, a real life example from um, colleagues up in a, another Colorado city, the city of Fort Collins, when the pandemic first, you know, hit, um, obviously there were, the whole city was looking at major budget cuts and Sue, their um, volunteer engagement, their citywide volunteer director, um, like everyone else had to come and, and essentially justify or um, explain the, you know, 
defend the budget, which included her job, um, as the whole city was looking at budget cuts. And she used a calculation, which it, like so many volunteer evaluation methods is it has both pros and cons. It's called return on volunteer investment. It looks at not just the, the financial value of contributed hours of volunteers, but also it puts them in a ratio against what's invested. So you look at all the things that your organization invests in volunteer engagement, salaries, training, technology, et cetera, and puts that um, and is able to then say, for every dollar we invest in volunteer engagement, we have over the last you know, year or 10 years, whatever it is, we have gotten a $6 return on every dollar invested if you look at volunteer hours from a financial standpoint. And again, while that has some limitations, in her case, it was um, a really powerful demonstration to the city to say, you know, we need to keep investing in volunteer engagement because our residents are going to be vital to helping us get through and recover from this crisis. So there's another piece there too. Um, great. Uh, I don't see any other questions. So in our last couple minutes, I'd love to pose a couple questions to you all. They're not meant only to be rhetorical. I'd love to see some comments in the chat or in the Q&A if you have some thoughts on this. One is to help you reflect and really take a moment and think, where am I? Am I positioned as a leader or am I positioned as a manager? And how do I know that, right? Where do I, what's the evidence of that? What meetings am I part of? Where are our results shared, our impacts? Um, and how can I move the needle? With whom do you make the case for engagement as a strategy? Or with whom do you need to make the case, right? Who sees and celebrates the results of volunteer engagement beyond just hours and dollars? Let's look at hours and numbers, right? What's, uh, where, do, where could you be making that case to help move the needle? And finally, which of these paths, a strategic plan, um, uh, 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 looking at perhaps a certification or, or an, a, a citywide approach, um, in response to a disaster, we, we're, we're still in the midst of one now, um, or uh, kind of leading by example through um, piloting change in one or two discrete areas, which path speaks to you? So feel free to put in the chat um, or Q&A uh, any, any reflections on that. In the meantime, I'll scan Jacob's question. Um, when I started my year of service, thank you if you're a National or State Service member, uh, thank you for your service. Your or, uh, Jacob's organization had very little set up within their volunteer system. Six months later, still struggling to create a foundation for volunteer organization while finding adequate response to the everyday needs of the organization. Do I have any tips on the best ways to reach out to the community and expand your volunteer network? Oh, so this isn't about the challenge, if I hope I'm understanding this, the challenge is not having the infrastructure inside the organization, it's having people to, to fill, um, to getting out to the community. So I think, especially in the time of COVID, uh, I think it what I've seen work is to partner with other organizations, businesses, faith-based organizations, other community groups um, who are looking to deploy their members, their associates, their employees to serve. Um, because so much of that was stripped away a year and a half ago. So um, it's basically, you know, partnering, it's not, it's not anything new, but, um, but be, be thoughtful and strategic about um, what partnerships you could leverage. Also look at informal volunteering uh, um, networks, mutual aid organizations, et cetera. There are so, there's been such a surge in informal volunteering. Many, and I don't know what type of organization you serve at, Jacob, and what sort of, um, screening is required if people are working with vulnerable populations, but I would look at your practices and see if they're all absolutely necessary. Um, one of the things we saw with pantries is that um, when you're not delivering food in someone's home, when in the apartments in New York City you're doing knock and drops and standing six feet away or you're leaving things on people's porches, people were able to revisit their screening requirements while still keeping clients safe but able to lower the barriers for people to engage so more people could step in, not requiring weekly service, making much more flexible opportunities. That also really helped bring in new path, new, new pipeline of volunteers. 
So I want to just um, make sure I leave time for Javita to do any final wrap up here. Um, and as I just sort of give a last little scan of the q and I'll just share a couple last thoughts here um, that it's really helpful for you to think about um, these pieces as you, as you put together your own personal action plan. What type of culture of engagement are you trying to create? How can you tie volunteer efforts into your organization's priorities? Before, maybe even look at that before deciding the right path forward, right? We knew one organization that knew that leadership would love the cachet of a certification, so they became certified as a service enterprise. For others, leading by example made more sense as a start because leadership wasn't fully bought in yet. Then decide on your path forward. Figure out what action steps you need, including getting the right people on board, as Amy talked about, and think about how you're going to define success. What will be successful for you? What, what, would, what would a culture of engagement look like a year from now, three years from now, um, as you move forward? And I invite you to visit our website for additional resources and encourage you to um, take part in the rest of this great series. You have some great speakers showing up. And, um, and with that, I'd love to just turn it back over to Javita to see if she has any other final comments before we close out. Great, thanks so much, Beth. Extraordinary presentation. Gotten a, a couple of uh, comments in the chat already about it. Um, and we are just so thankful for your time and this opportunity to learn uh, about something that is so critical um, in terms of elevating um, volunteer engagement uh, to uh, the level of strategy to it being fully incorporated because we know already that it is um, so vital uh, to our organizations achieving their missions and strengthening our communities. Um, I will be sending an email to everyone. It will include an evaluation as well as the slides um, and a couple other bits of information. I do encourage you to go to volunteerflorida.org so that you can see more about uh, the other um, opportunities that we have uh, over the next several Mondays. Uh, we also have our AmeriCorps uh, grant opportunity available now. So any of you who may have an interest, we are a grant-making organization and we're so thrilled to be able to offer those types of resources. Uh, I hope that you'll take a look at that. Also uh, register for our newsletter so you know more about our volunteer training, engagement training opportunities uh, that you'll consider Volunteer Connect as a great uh, way for you to share your opportunities uh, with the public. And I'm very happy to announce that Florida is now going to be um, a part of the hub, um, part of the service enterprise program that Beth talked about. So we've just received a grant for that, going through the trainings right now. So in the next year, you all will be eligible uh, for that type of opportunity. I will also include a link to that um, in the email I'm going to send. So, send. so thank you all so much for your time. Uh, we are so thankful for the tremendous work that you all do all across our state. We are proud uh, to serve you all. If you have any needs uh, or concerns that you'd like to share uh, with me, again, it's volunteer at volunteerflorida.org. You'll get the email with my contact information, and I'm happy to provide uh, any details or resources that might be beneficial to you that I'm aware of or point you in the direction of someone who may uh, be able to, um, to serve you. So with that, we'll go ahead and end the session. The recording will be available in the next week or so, and I will also email you when that is the case. So Beth, thank you. Thank you for your time and your insight. We are so appreciative, uh, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the week. Take care. Bye-bye, Beth. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.